All righty, so we're now live and recording, so we'll be cutting this early. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Give it just a minute or two while everybody comes in. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Mary Lou. <clears throat> While we let people come in, feel free to drop questions in our Q&A chat, um, and then we will answer them and work through our registered audience submitted questions as well at the end. And while everyone gets comes in, I will go ahead and get started. Hi, and welcome to WIST Presents, How I Got Into Sports Tech. Genevieve and I are former WIST fellows and are excited for you to join us today alongside Arman and Catherine to discuss all things NFL related. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with WIST, Women in Sports Tech is the nonprofit created to drive growth opportunities for women at all stages of their careers throughout the sports tech and innovation landscape. Through our community, we're uniting men and women to create a more successful and equitable industry. On today's webinar, how WIST presents how I got into sports tech, um, it was created to provide a platform for discovery and discussion. So we'll jump over to the bios now. Okay, Arman Aluwalia is the manager of business analytics with the Kansas City Chiefs. He just finished his sixth season at the Chiefs where he started up as a suite service intern in 2015. Arman's overall responsibilities include overseeing the measurement strategy, data processes, and assisting the corporate partnership sales and activation team. He recently started with a few co-hosts of podcasts focused, focusing on a strategy in sports business. Arman earned his bachelor's in management at Dalhousie University and his MBA with a focus in sports business at San Diego State University. Catherine Carlson was appointed senior vice president revenue and strategy for the Philadelphia Eagles in March, 2019. She is responsible for driving revenue for the team primarily through new sponsorship, media and pre premium seating opportunities. She also oversees strategy for the team uncovering new sources of revenue and utilizing data to make key business decisions for the future of the team. The Eagles were recently recognized in the Wall Street Journal for the number of senior women executives leading the business side of the team, something we'll touch on later. Since joining the Eagles, she has led the team in announcing several new partnerships, including DraftKings, FoxBet, Unibet, Pepsi, Firstness. <laughs> First Trust Bank, and most recently with Esports Entertainment Group. Catherine joined the Eagles after working 11 seasons for the Orlando Magic as Senior Vice President of Corporate Sponsors, Corporate Partnerships and Premium Activation. Catherine, an Australia native, earned a Bachelor of Business degree in Sports Management from Deakin University in Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. After graduating from Deakin, Catherine worked for various Australian sports organizations, including the Australian Hockey Association, Victorian Rugby League, and the Australian Institute of Sport. In 1997, she moved to the United States to complete a Master of Science degree in sport management at the University of Massachusetts. Catherine currently serves in a voluntary capacity as an independent board member for the US for USA Cricket. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. 
So this first question is for both of you. What inspired your interest in sports tech in the first place? Why sports tech over another industry? Kevin, do you want to go first? <laughs> Sure, no problem. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us today. We, we're honored to, to be here and share some of our trials and tribulations along the way. Um, so I, I would probably uh, characterize it, my career path uh, to the NFL as being a little untraditional as, um, as you just sort of went through my bio, but I, I, I would share some of the details because um, in the early 90s in Australia, so I'm originally from Australia, sports management was just a brand new degree. Um, in fact, we were the first group to ever go through this type of, of degree. And it was kind of groundbreaking in Australia. And it was sort of the beginning of a new level of professionalism in sport. Um, unfortunately, you know, sports analytics, sports tech, it just wasn't even a thing in the early 90s. And so, um, you know, a lot of what I do today is, is being on the job, learning along the way in, in various different different um, avenues. And I think, you know, I've always had a, a passion for sports. So I, I always knew that, that my chosen career was, was going to be in, in this arena. But um, my journey to the US was kind of interesting because I, I always looked to the US as a, as a leader in sports and in particular professional sports in the US was sort of the pinnacle of sports around the world. You know, big TV audiences, huge broadcast rights, sponsorship, big personalities. You know, it certainly was definitely a significant change from working in grassroots um, and semi-professional sports in Australia. Um, so I, um, I spent, my first uh, opportunity was in rugby league. So now I'm in the NFL. So I, I've, I guess I've started and book in both sides of my career in, in football, just different codes of football. Um, but I actually packed up my two suitcases and, and moved to the US to do it to a master's degree um, in sports management. And, you know, learning about the American way of sports, it just was such an interesting thing for me. I literally didn't know what the NCAA was when I first moved to the States. And then I attended a UMass basketball game and said, wow, this is on national TV. And this was after UMass's run to the final four. And so just um, really eye opening from that aspect. Um, but but completing my master's degree in the US, I, I, I took an internship at Disney. So one of the things that wasn't mentioned is that I actually spent um, 11 years working for Walt Disney World. And you may think, oh, that's an entertainment company, that's theme parks. But actually I started off at the Wide World of Sports, which you may all now be familiar with is it was the bubble for the NBA and, and soccer um, as we went into this pandemic this past summer. So I spent about six, six years working in sports there, but I think I found my true calling in business development. I was a bit of a numbers geek as well. So um, I took an opportunity. And, and sometimes when you're talking about your career path in our, our industry, sometimes it's not vertical. You can go sideways. Like everyone thinks that your career path, you go up the ladder and you stay in the same vertical. Well, I think I, I'm trying to bust that myth because some my the most risky thing I ever did was leaving sports for six years to work for the theme parks and, you know, Actually, my office was above a ride at one of the, the rides at Epcot uh, at Disney, if you're familiar with Disney. Um, but it's, it was really the best thing I ever did in my career because it was a risk and it, it gave me new skills. And so um, I always say that, say that is don't, don't be afraid to sometimes jump out. And trust me, I was very afraid to leave my comfort zone of sports to work in a, in a theme park. But the skills I gained there were just so tremendous. And so... Um, so I actually spent 23 years in Orlando and the, the last 10 years, last 11 seasons was the Orlando Magic. And my first year we went to the NBA finals, like against Kobe Bryant's Lakers team. So it was like the pinnacle in, of sports in my first year of professional sports. Um, but what I took away from my 11 years at the Magic is we had a really advanced analytics group. Um, actually, I think they have around maybe 13 staff that work on that. And and there was a reason for that. So they were very early adopters of, um, you know, the utilization of data and analytics into everyday sports. And so I really, um, really learned a lot of that. Even though I was on the business side, I was sort of uh, learned, learned that process from the ground up and really valued um, the, the data and analytics in the team. And so I, you know, and plus it's a mid-sized market. So we had to fill, fill our seats every game. And it was a hustle, trust me. And I think some teams 
you know, the, the data and analytics was born out of a need to, to uncover new fans. And I think um, that, that's why it was so prevalent in uh, Orlando. And so if I fast forward to my role today, you know, coming to the Eagles in the NFL, we don't have a ticket challenge. Our games are sold out. We renew at 99.7%. So probably I've got uh, other teams on this call probably mad at me for saying that. But um, so really for me, this role in overseeing revenue and strategy is um, how to, you know, we're very strong on the, the, um, the football side, but looking for opportunities and leveraging data to grow our business. Um, and we're, we're in our infancy stages. And, and that's the fun part of my job is, uh, you know, how do we, how do we um, truly integrate the data into our day-to-day -day, um, vocabulary and create that journey, um, which some of the other teams around the league are a fair way down the path of that journey. So that gives you a quick snapshot of uh, my, uh, my path to where I am now. It's all you, Armand. No, thank you. Now, look, I, again, I'll, I'll reiterate what, what Catherine mentioned earlier at the beginning is, you know, I'm, I'm honored and, and humbled to be on the panel and obviously share with, with, with Catherine, someone I, I, I aspire to and, and look for inspiration as well, just given her career path is a little bit similar in the sense of, you know, I wasn't born in the, in the United States either. I was, I was born in Canada to a, a mom from England and a dad from India. And so I feel like traveling and going out and pushing my comfort zone was just, it wasn't eventual, going to happen eventually. So yeah, I was I was very fortunate to have that kind of itch to try new things as as a as a young you know professional and kind of push my boundaries and you know I I really growing up I grew up in a family where sports wasn't the norm sports was not kind of our our thing that we talked about all the time I was very sports crazy growing up and always knew I wanted to work in the NFL as a Canadian that seems like a very far off goal and almost unreachable but. I kind of lucked into getting uh, getting the opportunity to do that, but I did have a passion for sport, and I knew very early on the defining moment for me was was in my class at Dalhousie in Halifax when we had a speaker come in, and she had worked on the bid for the Women's World Cup in Canada back in 2013. She came and spoke to us for the 2015 Women's World Cup, and so from that moment, that really turned the gears in my head of wow, there is an opportunity to go work in sports somewhere and FIFA coming to my home city in Winnipeg, the Women's World Cup, this is a global event. This is something I want to aspire to. And so that kind of became my North Star of everything I want to do is I want to try to get to there. So I got to build relationships with people and got to kind of build connections and figured out who the GM was and kind of, you know, I ended up going back to Winnipeg and working on the food and beverage side, something I've, you know, my family had restaurants, so I, I had that kind of experience, but knew that wasn't necessarily for me, but I happened to see the FIFA people coming in. And so I kind of like almost surprised the GM is like, hey, I'm, I, I know you're going to be the, the GM here of the Women's World Cup. Like, I'm really interested. We should talk. And so it was just one of those things where the NFL was always a North, you know, kind of the, the ultimate goal, but never thought I'd, I'd get here so fast. And so in terms of my career journey, you know, starting with the Chiefs on the sweet servicing side, given the background I had, I never really thought that I would end up in the analytics and the data space. I've always been a numbers person, just as Catherine mentioned earlier, would always be counting things and kind of analyzing and looking in different perspectives and trying to, to be the contrarian view or at least have a, okay, well, what if we spin it this way? And so really, I when I was at the Chiefs, there happened to be somebody that was leaving a financial analyst. And so he took a job for a different place. And that filled a void. And at that time, I was relatively new to the team. And my boss came to me and said, Hey, this person is leaving. They're filling this, they're leaving this void in what we need them to do. I think you have the skill set to do it. You're going to do it. And I was like, Okay, great. And so at the time, I was overwhelmed. And, you know, I called my mom when I got home and I was like, Oh my gosh, I, I'm now doing this over thing. And mom's like, That's good, right? And I was like, I think it is. I don't know. I, I'm a little, a little bit nervous because. You know, it requires me to use the, the, the full extent of my Excel skills and, and knowledge. And she was like, okay, well, do what you've always done and take a deep breath. Think about all the work and all the time you've put into this opportunity and you should be able to figure it out. And so, you know, step by step, day by day, week by week, I've made it my mission to kind of own that process and that, and that data source. And that's kind of where that's been the ability for me to kind of grow my career at the Chiefs and kind of add new opportunities to develop and learn new skills. I mean, 
measurement and kind of understanding how to calculate an ROI or build out that for a proposal or for a current partner was something I never had any idea how to do. And it wasn't something I was taught necessarily in school, but I had the foundations of understanding of, okay, if I can put the pieces together, I might be able to figure this out. And from there, I found a lot of passion. But the main reason that I've got to where I am today, I think is putting my hand up and saying, yep, I'll take on that responsibility or I know everyone's busy, but I feel like there's an opportunity here and I'm going to go make something of this. And so slowly but surely, I've added more and more and more um, to what I do. And a lot of it is really come from a place of passion. And so it's been interesting for me to kind of develop new skills and, and push the boundaries of, of different things, just like I have in my personal life. And uh, it's ended up not too bad here. So. Okay, so we're gonna segue from that to this question for you, Armand. You started at the Chiefs as a sweet service intern and worked your way up to manager of business analytics. Can you give advice to our attendees who are looking to work their way up and or make lateral career moves within an organization? For sure, yeah. And I think that I obviously gave a little bit of a, of a teaser to the answer here, so I, I won't try to repeat myself too much. But uh, I will say that moving up in the sports industry when I was in school I was always told look to move up in the sports industry somebody's got to leave or you've got to move out and so for me I, I've been fortunate enough that uh, that's not always been the case at the Chiefs that I've been fortunate enough to kind of create my own hybrid role where I've got people above me and I have a great mentor and boss in Kim Hobbs who Catherine knows very well and she has kind of helped me kind of create this little hybrid role of myself, or hybrid role for myself, sorry, in the sense that I have these unique skills. I don't really fit into this box, but I want to be able to create value and I'm valuable to the organization. So how can we work towards this? So for me, I think the advice I would find is, or give is, is that find someone that will be a pseudo kind of mentor and not necessarily going to that person and say, will you be my mentor, right? Like, I think it's more of a developing of a relationship and understanding and spending time, but also showing that person and having, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and saying, like, this is where I want to go in my career. What do I need from your perspective to try to get there? And then really kind of put a plan together. And more or less, I don't think I really ever had a plan that I would end up where I am today. And I had to kind of take things as they came and, and go, okay, well, great. I guess I'm going this way. I mean, one time I got, um, I, I got pulled into an, to a meeting with my former boss, um, Tyler Epp, and he said, hey, Molly's leaving. She's going to a different team. We need someone to run all of our media accounts. So that's going to be you. And I remember, again, not that I call my mom a lot. I said my mom is a very important figure in, 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 in my life. But I remember calling her and being like, I got stuck with all these media accounts. Like, oh, I'm so mad. Like, I just, I want to focus on this other thing. And now he's giving me this other role and I won't get to do the fun stuff I like. And I got to do that. And now two, three years later, I mean, a couple of weeks later, I went back and I apologized to Tyler. I was like, look, I know I didn't handle it the best. I was kind of a little bit upset. I wasn't, I was pouting a bit, but you know, two, three years later, I look back on that and go, that was so important. It gave me the foundation to understand the media side of our business, how people think on the TV side of advertising, radio advertising. I've built all these new relationships. I have an understanding and a passion for our media affiliate in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and what the value that brings to our organization. I can speak to that now. And so along the way, I've really, although you can't really see it in the moment, anytime you add something new, it will pay dividends down the road. I mean, I used to manage our parking vendor and like parking at Arrowhead for anyone that's come 20,000 cars coming in at one time. We're, we're, we're like basically parking a small city at Arrowhead Stadium. And so I would get calls all the time about how it's not working, how the partnership's not working. And so like, that was very stressful. But like now I understand like how the vendor works, all the very small dynamics. And so for me, it's taking lessons away from everything and kind of trying to get better 1% every day. And the compounded interest of that 1% every time will, in theory, pay dividends down the road. Nice. Yeah, it seems that the nonlinear path is is the way, the trend and it's, you know, what finds you and at the end. Um, so what is a typical day like in your job? So we're officially in the post 
the NFL off season. Um, how is your job different in season versus during the off season? Whoever would like to go first. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, look, I, I think um, people always think that, oh, the end of the NFL season would kick up, put your feet on the table, take vacation. It's, it's the off season, you know, it's six months of the off season. Um, I'm here to bust that myth because I, you know, in, in my role, um, there's never an off season. We may have a, a week after the Super Bowl and a, a week before training camp, maybe, but, um, you know, my job day to day is so varied and I actually, you know, no day looks the same, which I, that's kind of what I like about my job, but quite often the off season is, is, is busier. Um, you know, during the season you're attending games. Yes. And you've got those, that face-to-face -face interactions and, and the, and you know, with your sweet customers, with your, with all your um, corporate partners, but in the off season, that's really where the real work begins. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of recapping. We're in, we're in the midst of renewals. We're also in new sales. Um, we're actually for us, when we built a new premium club during COVID, um, which we're out selling now and, you know, working through our data and analytics to figure out who, who should we be targeting for this new club and how do we sell it when we're, you know, hopefully on the tail end of a, of a world pandemic. And so to us, the, you know, the off season is quite often busier. I'm sure most of you in the industry can attest to that. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it gives you a little bit of breathing space to jump into to metrics numbers, like how did we perform you know, seeing how our social media performs, look at our TV ratings, look at how our um, different uh, digital assets were. So digging into the metrics and figuring out, okay, here's how they performed. You know, maybe there's an exit strategy for some that didn't work. Maybe we can tweak and make them better. So it gives you a little bit more time to be thoughtful, but really it's planning and it's getting ready for the, for the upcoming season. It, it's 365 days a year. So I would say the off season is pretty much as busy, if not busier than during the season. You just don't have games. That's the only difference. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add a little bit. I think Catherine summed it up very well. But for me, a lot of it is actually the off season is actually busier than the in season for my role, right? I think the best way to sum it up is for me, the in season is to make sure all the work in the off season is actually working. And if it's not, how do we fix it, right? I think what I'm doing right now is you know, we're, we're, we're wrapping up business planning. We're doing all the recapping. I'm evaluating right now all of my vendors and trying to put together a strategy plan so that when the regular season and training camp shows up, that we're ready to go with the correct vendors. And we have thought partners in the space to understand what are our needs? How are we going to do that? And then if there is something that happens in season, but when you're in season, really, it's, you know, there's usually a game on Sunday or it's, it's either home or away. So you're either at the stadium or you're not. And if you're not, you're usually doing something with someone else or at least interacting with them because you know that they're at home. So you're texting them or whatever, building relationships. But yeah, really the off season, um, there's a little bit of a downtime in this kind of a window, but really like, it's almost like, well, we got to get ready on renewals because guess what? Like these, these big deals and partnerships are not small dollar amounts. So they, they take a lot of approvals and vetting and processing. And so really um, the off season is where actually a lot of the work does take place. Yeah, definitely. Cool, thank you for that insight. Uh, okay, so Catherine, the Eagles feature more female executives than any other football team. And there are a handful of women, including yourself at the VP level or higher, according to a 2019 Wall Street Journal article in which you were featured. NFL franchise employees were only 28% women last year and 18% at the VP level and higher. Only 23 of the league's 32 franchises reported employing more than one woman vice president last year. How has it felt to be a part of an organization who has committed itself to ensuring that women are represented in the front office? You've hit on my favorite topic, Genevieve. So, um, one of the things that initially attracted me to the Eagles was their commitment to women in leadership roles. That's just not the norm, as, as you pointed out. In fact, that research that you just quoted, I actually made sure I was on top of that research before considering that opportunity. So I did my homework prior to joining the Eagles and, um, you know, I researched those stats and 
it was a little concerning with certain teams, but then I realized that the, the Eagles were the exception or one of the exceptions. Um, and so, you know, I walked in to my first senior leadership meeting, you know, I report to our president of our organization and um, four out of six of our senior leadership team on our business side are women. Um, that's just, I, I've never, in all my time in 30 plus years working in sports, I, I have never seen that. Um, my first job in sports and rugby league, I was the only woman in the entire organization. So to walk into my first day of the Eagles and see four, um, you know, four of us at the table, um, I think was pretty incredible. Um, and I will say it's not just a seat at the table. It's the fact that we have a voice in shaping the strategy of our business. And that's, that's exciting. You, you can have a seat at the table, but once you're, you're in the decision-making um, mode, then I, I think that's just an incredible opportunity. Um, and I would say for me, I, you know, I, I really value inclusivity and it, it's part of my leadership DNA. Um, and I'm just excited to, to work for a team that, that values it like me. Um, and then just on the one other comment I want to make is that what I see a lot for women in sports is that um, we're, we're not risk takers. Um, I took a huge risk moving my family after 23 years in Orlando to come to the Eagles. And it was a huge, you know, uplifting my family, but the payoff is wonderful. And what I see with a lot of women um, up and coming leaders is they'll look at a job or an opportunity will come their way and they'll, they'll um and ah about the uh, job description and, They'll go through every single qualification or requirement. And like, I can't, I can't do this one of a hundred. I'm like, you're overqualified for the job. And whereas what I observe is that their male counterparts will look at a job description. If they're maybe 60% qualified, they're like, all in, let's go. And so what I, what I always encourage is, you know, jump in and take a risk. And there's, there's a quote I have, and I'm going to read it because it's, it's just so, it's stuck with me. And I, I always share it with, with um, mentees and people that I've mentored over the years. And it's actually from Richard Branson. So Richard Branson, as you know, the founder of Virgin Atlantic, um, he says, if someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not quite sure if you can do it, say yes and learn how to do it later. So take that as, a, as one of the, things that I hold on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I took a risk and I, I did that. And I'm, I'm working as, a, you know, as a, an executive at the, at the Eagles now. And I think that was a, the best piece of advice I could have ever uh, read and it just stuck with me. So um, hopefully I can pass it on and share it with uh, folks on the, uh, the call today. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, Arman, as our male ally representative, what are some of the ways in which you support women in the sports tech space? Yeah, I, I will say, like, when you say that, I don't take that statement very lightly. I, I'm, like I said, I'm very humbled and honored to be part of this conversation and hopefully shifting more women in sports tech in the future and, and beyond. So, yeah, I, I don't take this lightly from, from what I'm about to say. But, yeah, so for me, you know, one of the opportunities I think that has been great for me has been able to work under uh, a, a, one of my, my, my boss, Kim Hobbs. And so she has been able to provide a fresh perspective and a great role model and example for me. But one of the things that I've done recently, as I mentioned in, in the bio, is that I started a podcast. And so Will and I, when we initially started, we were like, look, we're two males. Like we want more representation in the analytics space. We think it's super important because for me, even myself, I grew up in a very diverse background, right? My dad's from India, my mom's from England. Like I, I have a very unique perspective and different life experiences that Catherine may have as well too, or Sydney or Genevieve. Like everyone has a unique perspective. And I think having more women at the table, both in the leadership, but also in the entry level roles as well too, will continue to make the sports industry better, right? And I think it is so crucial. So one of the things that we did was our first guest was Brittany Ramos of the Los Angeles Rams. And Brittany is a superstar beyond that. And so we said we wanted to have her as a co-host to add another female perspective, right? We've also been very conscious in our decisions about the types of guests that we do invite. Not to say that we're trying to specifically target a certain type of person, but 
we want to have all voices heard because it does provide that perspective. Because from my, my experience in my life growing up is that just because you think of some way doesn't mean it's the only way, right? Someone may see something from a different angle that could impact your business, could impact your personal relationship, could impact anything that you do in your life. And so for me, it's always about having that diversity of thought is super important because if you just have a room full of men and it has been for so long, you're going to get one way of thinking. And right now in this era in COVID where change is being accelerated, right? If teams don't start to adapt this more and start to have more gender, gender neutrality um, or uh, in that sense of diversity, I think those teams will be left behind. And so I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of it. I think it's a massive step in the right direction. I'm fortunate enough to be part of a department that has a very close um, diversity on the gender side as well too. So, but there can always be improvement, right? And I, I think about it as, I think there was a quote being like, you know, for the longest time, there have been 12 men or, you know, all men on most CEOs or most boards, right? Like who's to say that it can't be the other way as well too, right? And I'm, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but at least like it needs to be switched. It needs to be flipped on its head because it is so important. And I think it, I think it's time for that. Awesome. Well, we're happy to have you as part of our change and community. Thank you. Um, and we're going to quickly go through a speed round. Um, favorite books, any recommendations? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, one book I always re re recommend um, for women and for, and for guys, but it was, it was very eye-opening for me. And this was probably, you know, 10, I probably read it 10 to 15 years ago, but I, I do quote it quite often. It's um, Why Girls go, Don't Get the Corner Office. And it's a really interesting book because um, it shares a lot of concepts around like you need to network like a man, which sounds very weird. But um, so I started to just observe my office and how our dynamics in our office. And, you know, I, I, I mentored a a, a manager um, and she's, she's really smart. She was, um, she was actually um, a business manager, had a legal background and she was probably the most, the hardest working person ever. And um, when I, when she goes, why am I get, not getting promoted? I said, well, just cause you're the hardest person working in the room. It doesn't mean you're um, hardest person that works in the room it, it doesn't necessarily get you that promotions and it allows you know you to um you, you need to network spend time with your peers and and create those opportunities so that book was life-changing uh, for me and then me now as a as a mom of a teenager um i'm reading a book called boy mum right now in the love language of teenagers and i think if i can figure out how to manage a teenager and motivate a teenager I can pretty much manage any team that you put me in front of any challenging staff member. I'm got it. I, I, if I can manage my, my teenager, then I think I can, uh, then I can manage the world. <laughs> um, so I guess for my books, I, I, I try to read an audio book once a week if I can. Um, so my kind of three that I always like to talk about that were really impactful on my, on my kind of perspective was, Good to Great by Jim Collins. I feel mm -hmm. like when I read that, it completely transformed the way that I think about business. Um, think Like a Rocket Scientist by Ozan Veral was also something that I really, really enjoyed and just a different way of looking at things. Um, and then the last one is, again, anything by Malcolm Gladwell, but specifically talking to strangers. Um, again, as a Canadian, I, I, I like to lean towards him a little bit heavier, but uh, that was also another really, really good book uh, as well, too. So. And then um, aside from your podcast, Arman, do you guys have any quick podcast recommendations for our attendees? Yeah, I mean, I, I also listen to a lot of podcasts too, so I'll try to be as brief as I can. So uh, I think for me, the, the Prof G show with Scott Galloway has been kind of an interesting lead. It's a re uh, listen, I guess, not read. Um, it's a little bit un, it, it's, he, he's a little bit like interesting in his takes, but he has a very unique perspective. And I think I, I value what he says a lot. And then um, work life with Adam Grant has also been really, really interesting as well too. So. And then on my side, I, I love a podcast called Sports Geek. It's run by a gentleman named Sean Callahan out of Australia. Um, he's just, really fascinating and I love the the um, breadth and you know the fact that he interviews people in our industry around the around the world so I, I enjoy that um, and then just for sort of guilty pleasure I like listening to business wars 
So it talks about the the, the wars between brands and the, and the history between like McDonald's and Burger King and um, you know different and I, I just and the cereal war like I find that historical part of um, you know brands over the over the last century to be just fascinating. And then sort of on the geeky side, I love the in, inside sports business. Um, it probably resonates with a lot of um, analytics and uh, folks in the industry. So I, I listen to that. Oh, awesome. They all sound like really good recommendations. And in our newsletter, we'll also have all of this information just in case anyone misses it. Um, but let's go over to the audience submitted questions. We have quite a few, so we have about 10 minutes. So let's see how many we can get through. Uh, this past NFL season was like was unlike any other. Um, how did your revenue strategy change when you weren't able to sell tickets to games uh, for full capacity, what other avenues did you turn to for revenue? Catherine, why don't you go to that one? Sure. Um, well, we had three games that so we had a whole 5,500 spectators. Um, so, you know, we, um, it, it was, it was an interesting business challenge, um, particularly on the ticketing side. You know, we had to, when we were only limited with, if we had suites, we could only have six people in a, in a 20 person suite. And so, um, it was, it was challenging to, um, it was actually more challenging than we thought. And we did everything right. We surveyed our participants. We, we asked them, you know, if we have seats available, can you come back? And um, what we found was, is that it, there was a lot of restrictions with corporations. Um, so even if, so if a corporation or a company owned a suite, you know, six seats, it was really like, well, I can't give it to how I usually use it. I, I can't give it to my customers or I can really only give it to one pod of, of people that are in the same household. And so it became very much a business challenge. Um, so for us, we were really flexible with our customers. Um, you know, our, our goal was to, we, we actually did a universal opt out of all our um, suite holders. And then when, when suites became available, we, we, um, we sold that opportunity. Um, but where, from a revenue standpoint, um, in the in the during COVID, we actually built out a new um, premium space. It's called the Foxbet Lounge. It's on the the lower level of our stadium, and we'll be launching that um, in the upcoming season. So we really spent a lot of time uh, looking at new ways um, or new revenue opportunities for that. We just took a year longer. We had a whole year to plan for it, so that actually worked out quite well. Um, and on the corporate side, we just got creative. Uh, you know, we looked at, you know, on the new sales side, we thought, okay, what categories in, in, the, in the universe are being impacted by COVID and which, which business categories are perhaps are, are um, having a pretty big business boon because of what industry they're in. So everything from clear to, you know, Ubers and, and del or sorry, Uber Eats, like delivery of food, cleaning supplies, like think about all the things that have done well um, in the COVID era. And so for us, it was just pivoting where we were focusing our time and effort and creating those new revenue streams that were perhaps categories that didn't exist um, a year ago. So that was, um, that, that was our strategy to really um, look at how to drive revenue with limited um, availability for the, for the, for the, um, fans to go in. And then the other thing is really pivoting in, in person um, assets and looking and pivoting them over to digital and social. So um, the digital and social part of our organization was um, very busy as we transformed a lot of assets um, from the, the in person world to the virtual world. And that was um, some great innovation came of that. So that was a that was a fun project. Yeah, and, and, and for us, you know, we were, we were in a very similar type position as well, too. We were actually able to have fans for every game, almost 15,000 per game. And again, depending on which state you were in, which governor and whatnot, I think that made a bit of a difference. We actually did COVID testing for all of our suites. So we were able to retain about 40% of our suite members for this season, giving the option to other. But yeah, we really kind of utilized the digital and social as well as the tarps as well to kind of help keep a lot of our partners whole from a, from a media evaluation perspective. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, Catherine, this is for you. So recently the Eagles became the first NFL team to sign an esports tournament provider and 
dive into esports. Can you speak to the partnership and how esports has become a major player in the sports entertainment industry? Yeah, I think entering into the esports universe, it's something that, you know, we've, we've had our eye on, you know, as, as, as a traditional sports property. And, you know, I think just the popularity of esports is just growing. And, and for us at the Eagles, it, it really, we, we view it as a, as a way to tap into a new generation of fans. Um, you know, when we were initially contemplating jumping into esports, um, you know, all our research pointed, or we quickly uncovered that there was just a huge population of Eagles fans that were also Madden. And the, the data was growing exponentially on a yearly basis. And so our partnership with EEG, Esports Entertainment Group, um, was really our first step into a you know competitive gaming space. Like, but it's not new to the NFL. The NFL actually has an EA Madden championship. So all 32 teams compete um, and then it culminates in, a, in, a, in an in-person event. By, for, for us, our partnership with EEG, they are an online tournament provider. So for us, it's, it's appeals to the masses. And so the way we're working with them is we're actually creating two tournaments, one at the kick off the season and one mid season. And the goal is really to get thousands of people involved in the, in the um, qualifying tournaments online. And then with the big crown jewel to be the, the on, on-premise um, championship at Lincoln Financial Field. And the way we're leveraging the traditional sports side is that we're, we're appointing um, player ambassadors to really help amplify it. Because you think a lot of our players are in their early 20s. And what are they doing in their spare time? They're playing video games. And for us, you know, bringing in some players to be part of this, maybe they're going to show up at the tournament. You know, we're going to do some fun stuff around um, videos with them playing, push it out on their handles, push it out on our social channels as well. So we just see that this, this is such a, a, a great market for us and really getting that elusive 13 to 17 initially, but in the tournament play, like those 18 to 35 year olds, which ultimately we want to get them in the fan funnel. So they become a, a fan in the Eagles as, a, as an esports fan. And then they're going to get to a point where they're purchasing tickets. They're purchasing our, you know, our merchandise. They're participating in our, our, our events and, and um, consuming our media. So for us, it's just, a, you know, it's taking advantage and, and, and bringing in a new fan base to our, you know, foundation of our, our overall fan base. Awesome. We have about two minutes left. Um, and I do want to ask one more question there. You guys have submitted a lot of good questions. Um, here's one. What do you see as an area of improvement in the sports analytics field today? I think, uh, you know, I think one of the areas in the sports analytics space is that adding of more resources, right? I think that in theory or over the time of the last couple of years, uh, sports teams have really started to add more resources in this space. And I still think there is even more ability to add more resources, i.e. whether that's people or software or kind of uh, reporting tools to this space. Because I think traditionally sports teams kind of follow big fortune 500, 1000 companies in terms of their practices, maybe three to four years behind. And they kind of a little bit lagging where data is everything to every company, right? Every major tech company isn't, you know, Tesla, some people say is actually a data company, right? It's a, it's an experience company. And so I think about that in the sports industry where there could be a lot of improvements with a lot of higher end data reporting and resources to that, whether that's data engineering or creating out of uh, data warehousing and, 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 and things like that. So that's where I see a large opportunity um, in the data analytics space currently at the moment. I think awesome. you, I think you answered it well. <laughs> Nothing to add. Well, thank you guys so much for um, joining our panel today. Um, we had great time. Thanks, Genevieve, for joining us this week. Um, and also feel free to go to our website, womeninsportstech.org. We now have a career hub um, with a ton of different opportunities and um, brands to work with. Um, and we're excited to welcome everyone a part of our community. Thank you again for joining our NFL themed webinar today. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having you. us.
Right. 